so we are, this is our college word time. This is our penultimate study in Proverbs. You know what penultimate means? Second to last. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is our second to last one. This is the 37th one we've done. Uh, and it's, uh, we're going to look at 1 through 9 tonight. It's on 1031 in the Pew Bible if you want to use that. But just like I said, 1 through 9, uh, just kind of touching base on it. In uh, 1956, an American science fiction author named Philip K. Dick wrote a book called The Minority Report. The Minority Report. A story tells of a, a, a world where there are these three mutants. Just bear with me. There are these three mutants that they call precogs because they have precogn precognitive abilities. They can see the future. And they are used by a, the police force. And the police force division that uses them is called pre-crime. And there, these precogs tell of crimes that will be committed. And then the police go and arrest the person before they can <laughs> commit the crime. Now, science fiction may not be your thing. If you don't want to read, there is a movie of it. It's not as good as a book, but that's okay. Uh, but anyway, sometimes science fiction has a way of being predictive. Those who are concerned about gun violence uh, in this country are, there are some, I mean, of course, everybody's concerned about it. Nobody's unconcerned. But there are some who are really interested in that sort of an idea. And so they have these things, they, they want to have these red flag laws. Well, we'll arrest people that probably would do a thing. Uh, so, I mean, obviously we have to be careful of that kind of thing. But in this passage tonight, we're going to see that um, there's a mother here that sort of sees what trouble could happen and is warning her son before it happens. And that's sort of the gist of what's going on in this uh, section. Now we will have three, a three-part outline in our little passage here. Uh, verses one and two is uh, a mother speaks to her son. Three through five, rulers are not to drink and forget. Three through five, rulers are not to drink and forget. And six through nine, aid the poor. So one, one and two, mother speaks to her son. Three through five, rulers are not to drink and forget. Six through nine, aid the poor. All right, so this first section, we start at verse one. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him, what my son and what son of my womb and what son of my vows. So <clears throat> we're at the close of the book of Proverbs. We have another writer that is not an Israelite. We really don't know who Lemuel is. He's a king and he's, he is of a family that worships God. But beyond that is just speculation. He's not a king in Israel, not a king in Judah. He's a king. Um, now, it's not really difficult to find people who are critical of the Bible. Um, and, and one criticism they would have is that it's very male-centered. It it's all about the patriarchy. <laughs> And I have to smile because I just, the things we choose to be upset about uh, often is not something we ought to be upset about. But anyway, as is often the case, when a, if you wrap your mind around something that it, you just convince yourself that things are a certain way, then finding evidence to support your preconceived notion is really the easy part. If you think that um, if you think that uh, the Bible 
is male dominated, it's easy to find the evidence. If you think that the Bible is not trustworthy, it's easy to find the evidence. If you think that uh, the police are out to get you, it's easy to find the evidence. Once you decide something and you just, you make your decision ahead of time, finding the evidence is easy because you'll interpret everything you see as being supportive of what you decided. That's not really a, an intelligent way of doing things. It's not a wise way of doing things, but it is a very common way of doing things. Very common. Um, <clears throat> so there are people here that um, they, they skip over that finding evidence because, well, they've already decided, so they don't need the evidence. They just know. But here we see the words of King Lemuel. The words of King Lemuel. And, and what are his words? What are the, what's the source of his words? His mother. The words of King Lemuel are the words that his mother taught him. I mean, it's, it's hard to estimate, to overestimate, the amount of impact that our mother's have on us, whether, whether we'd like to admit it or not, we are who we are in large part to the influence of our mothers. I, you know, you know, I've talked a lot about my dad. Well, I mean, my dad's still around. So I tend to think of him more often than mom, just because he's there and, and sadly she's not. If you had known me when mom was around, you'd hear me talk about her all the time because I was much closer to my mother than I ever was my dad. I've gotten closer to my dad since mom's been gone, but uh, most of what I learned about God in the church, like 98% came from mom. Mom had a huge impact on me. Lemuel's mother had a huge impact on him. And what does she have to say? Why, why is he concerned about what she has to say if he's the king? Well, it turned out, turns out that the, in uh, these ancient societies, Israel would be like this too, though this isn't Israel. He's not a king in Israel. Um, it turns out that the queen mother played an important role in the royal household. Often, her job was to keep the king aware of what was going on with the servants or the, the ladies in the harem or the women in the harem. Maybe they're not ladies. I don't know. But those females. He, she, she would kind of keep tabs on that and keep him apprised of that. She, she acted as, a, as an advisor. And since she's his mother, a trusted advisor. Now, again, we might not... You might wonder about, like, does the Bible really tell us that? No, but other other things do. And but also, if you read through the uh, books of First Second Kings, First Second Chronicles, often it tells you who the king is and tells you who his mother is. Whereas in a lot of cases, in genealogies and stuff, they don't list the women. That's one of the reasons that you know the Bible is all about the patriarchy, but. No, but in this case they did because the, the queen mother had this unique role. She had influence with the king. Um, and, you know, another thing, being the king might sound good, might sound like it, you know, it's all, it's all upside, it's all perks, but it would have its downsides. And one of the things that it had was the king basically always sort of needing to look over his shoulder and make sure nobody's coming for him. If he had that going, if he had that concern, having his mother around and being able to trust her is one more layer of security because two pairs of eyes looking for trouble is going to be better. So his mother was important to him here. Now, <clears throat> again, if the Bible only cared about one small group of people, Israelites, and really if the Bible only cared about the men in that group, 
it'd be a lot different than it really is. It would just be different. There would be here. Not only is the Bible happy to include instructions and insights of a woman, but their insights of a non-Israelite woman. So like she's completely out of the circle in that we would, might assume would be the people God would care about. The people that this God in a book that I don't think either of them are real would care about. If I've already decided that the Bible is just, you know, a lot of hooey, then this is going to come as a little bit of a surprise. Okay. Um, but really, when we think about this, I think it should remind us of the church. The beauty of the church, the New Testament church, church like us, the beauty of the church is that that's a place where there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. That idea is really foretold in the Old Testament. And this would be an example of that. This would be an example of that. Uh, because she is not male, she is not Jew. So but yet God cared about her and she cared about God, right? So um, I think it's easy uh, to be sort of lazy in an outlook and not really read the Bible, but just have an opinion. I think a lot of people, I'm sure not everyone, but a lot of people that you might see pipe up on social media that have negative things to say about the Bible, probably haven't read it in a while. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to pass a, a, a test to get a, an account on Facebook or Instagram <laughs> or Twi um, X or you know TikTok, whatever. I mean, they'll. They'll give them out to anybody. You don't even have to be able to prove that you know a thing or two. So just because there's people that have this, this opinion eh, doesn't mean that that's, that's the way it is. Um, Israel had a unique place in Scripture because they were supposed to be God's messenger to share his message of love to other people. Israel was to be used to bring Gentiles to God. They didn't always do it, just like you and I don't always do the way the best we should. But that's what their that's what their job was. That's why God picked them. He picked them for a job. He didn't pick them to pet them. And he didn't save us to pet us either. He saved us so that we might help him influence other people around us. That's that's part of what we do. All right? Now, do you remember what a coda is? A what? Coda. The, the end. The end, yes. Coda is a town word for tail. It's a musical term. It's the end. Okay? This is part of that. So uh, chapter 30 and 31, they're part of the coda. And since this is a poetic way of doing things, it really shouldn't just end, but it should tie everything up sort of artfully as well as rhetorically. So when we see here at the very end, a mother's instruction, that's a callback all the way back to chapter one in verse eight, where it says, my son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. So that sort of tying it back to the beginning, that's not an accident, it's not a mistake, it's not a hap it's not serendipity, it's not the happy accident, oh look. No, it's on purpose, because it's being poetic. A lot of poetic devices in Hebrew are that kind of thing, where they have uh, connections on the outside, connections here, and something different in the middle. And so this is a large-scale version of that. 
Um, it's going to be a little less than obvious since there's so much that's intervened. I mean, there's a lot of verses in between chapter 1, verse 1, and where we are now. The idea that you would sit and read them in one sitting and retain that and be like, oh, wait, look, that goes right back there. You might not. But if it can be explained, it's probably on purpose. So I think it, that is what's going on here. Also, um, one of the commentaries I read said that this woman's uh, words here are an example of a particular genre of writing called royal instruction. There was, there was uh, things written to help people that were going to be in um, a position of leadership. Royal instruction. In fact, this is the only example of that genre of writing written by a woman. So, there's the Bible being ahead of the being ahead of the curve on that regard. It's not just about men. It's not just about Jews. It's about people because God loves everyone. And when I say this is the only uh, example of that royal instruction written by a woman, a woman, I don't mean just the Bible. Just anything. So I think that's pretty important. Now, <clears throat> when we when we see that verse, the uh, verse two, the word what can also mean to listen. I think, at least to my ears, it makes a little more sense that way. <laughs> listen, my son. Then she emphasizes, listen, son of my womb. Listen, son of my vows. If he is the son of her vows, does, does that remind you of another mother in Scripture? Of Hannah. She made a vow that if God would give her a child, she would give him back to God. And what was her child's name? Samuel. Samuel, yes. She was barren. She begged God for a son. Samuel was a son of her vow, so we assume that this is a similar situation here. Okay, all right, look at verse 3. Rulers are not to drink and forget. Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. So, again, she is being proactive. She's not correcting a behavior that she sees. She's saying, don't do this, like this could be in the future, don't do this. So, what was the king's Job. What, what was the king supposed to do? Now, we already said that he's not an Israelite king. Let's think for a minute about an Israelite king. What was Israel's king supposed to do? Does anybody have any ideas about what his responsibility was? Care for the people. Care for the people. Anybody else? Stay true, stay true to God. Stay true to God. Somebody else said something? I said leave them. Okay, all right. What was one of the first things that the first king of Israel did? Who's first king? Saul. What was one of the first things he did? He did. And what was one of the first things God told him to do? Fight. So they had to, they had to lead in that kind of thing, okay? In, in uh, Deuteronomy... Moses took some time to say what the king should not do. This is from Deuteronomy 17, uh, starting with verse 15. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall, uh, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Okay, 
So um, I, I see here that I, I made a jump in what I wrote down that makes sense in my mind. So now I'm gonna have to explain it to make it make sense in your mind. Um, so when she explains, or when she gives this instruction about drinking wine, intoxicating drink, because it'll make you forget the law, it'll make you pervert justice. Uh, in my mind, I was thinking of these verses here in Deuteronomy as the kinds of things that might be forgotten. Okay, so it is uh, the, the part that I said about irony is that um, um, oh no, I didn't jump ahead, sorry. Sorry, I just looked at my verse three. It's there, okay. So verse three, do not give your strength to women, that part, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Okay, so isn't it ironic that the book of Proverbs, at the end of the book of Proverbs, largely composed, not entirely, but largely composed of the wisdom of Solomon, we get verse three here. Don't give your strength to women. That was Solomon's besetting sin. That was what got Solomon messed up. Don't give your strength to women. That was what he did. He, Solomon, had every advantage possible. He had great wisdom. You could say he just knew it all. He had unbelievable wealth. He had it all. And yet he still blew it. It turns out that no matter how smart a person is, no matter how much they have by way of resources, if they fail to listen to God, it will lead to ruin. It'll, it'll lead to trouble. And for Solomon, it certainly did. Solomon had almost a thousand women at his disposal. He had, but see, that's just it. Yes, he had, what, 300 wives? 600 wives, 300 concubines. 600 wives, three, okay. So, sure. But. You can't imagine for a moment that even one of those 600 wives, talking to the men, was anything like your wife in the role they played in that relationship. Because they couldn't be. <laughs> your wife probably has accused you at one time or another of not spending enough time with her or paying enough attention to her. If she's one of a thousand, she's not going to say that because she knows any attention she gets is actually surprising. Solomon having that many wives and that many concubines is completely utilitarian. It is to make his life better. Some of them were political alliances. Some of them were just to like show, just to show off his ostentatious wealth. I mean, it's it's a bad thing. It's it is not a situation born of commitment or service. It's just hedonism. He he didn't ever have to be lonely. <laughs> not in that way. It's just completely self-serving. You know, you don't have to go that many books later after 1 Kings, which is where we see with Solomon. You don't have to go that many books later to get to Esther. And we read and we feel sorry for Esther because she's degraded by being put in a harem like that. But that's exactly what Solomon had. And Solomon's harem would have put Ahasuerus' harem to shame because Solomon's was much larger. And yet he was supposed to be Mr. Wisdom. <laughs> it's a problem. We've talked about drinking before, but here it comes up again at the end. Lemuel's mother says, it's not for kings to drink wine or intoxicating drink. I read that and I'm like, well, isn't that kind of precisely what kings do? I mean, it seems like that's what they do. The NIV is a little different here. It says that they, they shouldn't crave alcohol. Uh, but I mean, they couldn't go get a Pepsi. The water wasn't always reliable, so they didn't have access to a lot of different liquids. 
Um, based upon what the Old Testament says about Nazarite vows, uh, uh, Samuel was a Nazarite, Samson was a Nazarite, though he didn't keep his vows very good. Uh, but that was an unusual thing. Nazarites were unusual because they didn't drink. They had some other things too. But So we have to say that complete total abstinence was unusual in those days. But the principle is still true that drinking leads to poor decisions. You think about Belshazzar's feast in the book of Daniel. They're having a big party with the king. They're drinking. And he's like, hey, you know what we ought to do? Let's get out the stuff that we got from the temple in Israel. We'll drink out of that. That didn't work out so well. Um, <clears throat> in our day, it's, it is somewhat unusual to follow the total abstinence plan as regards alcohol. I, I, I hope and pray it's not unusual in our Nazarene churches, but in society at large, it is. The people that I used to work with virtually all drank. Most of them seemed that part of the goal when they drank was to get a little bit lit. I don't know that the people I worked with, I'm not saying none of them did this, but it seemed like they weren't necessarily going to just go get so drunk that they had to be carried away. But they did want to get intoxicated. That was what they were after. It seemed like that was the main purpose of doing it. Nothing good comes of that. Nothing good comes of that kind of living. Alcohol is a net negative in our society. It really is. It's just a net negative. Uh, some years ago, some social warriors decided what they were really going to take, they're going to fix society and they're going to make it so you can't smoke in public. And they've largely been successful. You can't even smoke in a bar. I, I find that so funny. Yeah. You can't smoke in a bar. We have all this, you know, uh, all these programs for kids and stuff, but they're completely hypocritical. I'm sorry. You may be a big believer in dare. I find it hypocrisy. Because, you know, we, we have drug and alcohol resistance education, but yet we never have a goal of stamping out alcohol. But we did have a goal of stamping out cigarettes, which is interesting to me because I can't remember the last time I heard of somebody um, getting in a terrible car wreck and killing somebody else's kid because they were on nicotine. <laughs> but they do on alcohol with some regularity. Anyway, verses six through nine, aid the poor. Give, give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Now I'm curious, how many of you are surprised when you read verse six and seven? Give drink to him who is perishing, Wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty. How many of you are surprised that's there? Okay. How many of you have uh, ever heard a sermon preached on that? <laughs> Me either. Our text today, give drink to him who is perishing. I thought we were supposed to rescue the perishing. You were supposed to like, get him liquored up. <laughs> it seems funny to me. But I think, I think we need to think a little bit here before drawing a conclusion of what they're saying. So first of all, I want to suggest to you that a good, play, a good starting place when reading the Bible, when we read Scripture um, and we come across passages that are hard to understand, we have to not stop there. Okay. Now sometimes when we read Scripture, we come across passages that are not hard to understand, but they're hard to do. It's not hard to understand when Jesus said, when someone hits you on the right cheek, turn to him to the other also. It's not hard to understand what he said. It's hard to do it. When he said, forgive the one that offends you, it's easy to understand. It's not easy to do. So we, we have scriptures like that. Um, there are also verses that we understand 
but they're not really asking us to do something or not to do something, um, like historical passages, for example. Moses parted the Red Sea. It's easy to understand what it's saying. It's not calling me to do something directly. It, we can make application, we can learn from it, of course, but it's not that sort of a passage. Um, but there are passages, though, that we look at and we don't understand what they're saying. And when that happens, I mean, we might have to get out a dictionary or a commentary or Siri or Google and start asking questions. And I'm not even joking about Siri and Google. Siri is probably not as good at, as Google at answering those questions, but sometimes you can find, you can get a start on some things you might not understand in that way. Um, sometimes uh, we look at a verse like verse six, I don't think it's any of those. It seems easy to understand what it's saying, but hard to figure out why it's saying what it says. And I, I would say as a rule, when we don't understand something in the Bible, the problem isn't the Bible. <laughs> if I just, if, boy, this just doesn't make sense. Okay, the problem is not the Bible, the problem is me. It might not, I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm deficient. I'm saying if I can't understand what's going on in the scripture, the problem's not there. The problem is me, and I need to find a way to bridge that gap. Just like we were talking earlier, if I don't understand God, well, the problem is not God. The problem is me. I have to decide if I trust him or not. And also, frankly, if I could explain everything about God and every reason that he had or would have for doing a certain thing, I'm basically saying I'm on a level with God. I can't explain it all. He's God and I'm not. It's not satisfying to people, but it is the truth. So this scripture, like we don't, we might not know what's going on there, but I think if we start there with some of the things I've said, we'll get a little bit farther. Now, Lemuel's mother is at the bottom of this council, and she's trying to exhort him as king to aid the poor, to help the poor. The poor are always a topic of concern in a civilized society. That often their poverty keeps them from being able to help themselves. So the king had a responsibility to do what he could to make their lives better. He had a responsibility to do what he could to make their lives better. We, we still spend a lot of time and energy thinking about that very thing. Political candidates, not just this year, every year. Every time it comes around, political candidates often try to paint themselves as the champion of the little guy. And my opponent, he only cares about rich. We're supposed to not like that. But I mean, here's the thing. When times get hard, you know who's going to be okay? The rich. They're going to be okay. I, I, I don't mean that I agree with the rhetoric that, you know, they're just about tax breaks for the rich. And I'm going to do this, and we're going to make the rich pay their fair share. I'm not talking about that. Okay? What I am saying is, generally speaking, I find that kind of rhetoric duplicitous. Meaning, some people that go on and on about the rich, what they mean is the rich, like Elon Musk. There's an example of a billionaire that you're supposed to think is bad by some people's standard. <laughs> Taylor Swift is a billionaire. That's nice. We like her. George Soros is a billionaire. He's okay. That's political talk. That's not what we're doing, okay? Here's the thing though. If a poor person is worth $1,500, I just picked a number out of the air. That, you'd agree, that'd be pretty poor. If that's what you've got, that's all you got to your name, 1,500. If a policy comes along and it costs every man, woman, boy, and girl in the country a thousand dollars, you're wrecked. You, you, it took two thirds of everything you had. 
A thousand dollars from from uh, Taylor Swift. She's not going to notice. Neither is Oprah. Neither is Elon Musk. Neither is Donald Trump. Neither is Kamala Harris. Thousand dollars means nothing to them. They have enough money to ride out those problems. A thousand dollars times multiples. Okay, so it is incumbent upon kings. It is incumbent upon governments to try to make the lives of the poor better. Now, I'm not suggesting that the way to do it is to write a check. We've tried that for decades now. It's not making, we have, we've been fighting the war on poverty since the 60s, and we have more poverty now than we've ever had. We've lost the war. We need to try a new tack. Okay? Um, so, all of that's true. I don't want you to get sidetracked, but I want, you to I want you to go back to the real question is, what's up with giving drink to the poor? Should we make up cards with these, you know, verse six and seven on it, print them out, and then we'll like get a rubber band and tape the, or wrap those on beer bottles and hand them out to people at the fair? I'll give a cup. I'm giving you a cold beer in Jesus' name. Remember, giving drink to the poor. That's fine. You look poor. Here, there's a couple guys up the library hanging out. Let's go get them some beer. Is that what we're supposed to do? It sounds wrong. You'd have to admit. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get labels for fifths of vodka that say Taylorville First Church of the Nazarene that we can give out. It just seems wrong. Okay, I don't think that's what's at play here. But I do think that at least this is true of this, of, of this time period. In those days, there were no hospitals. Hospitals are a much more modern thing than this. Hospitals didn't come around until like the 11, uh, after about the time of the Crusades, 1100s, right in there, the first hospitals. There's no doctors that, as we have them. And if there were doctors, whatever kind of doctors they had, they're not doing for the poor. They're selling their goods. So the poor, though, they don't have doctors. They don't have hospitals. They don't have that. But what do they still have? They still have aches and pains. And so they have to deal with it in some way. And alcohol could be used medicinally. When we hear somebody say, oh, I only use it medicinally, we think it's a joke. Because usually it is. But it might not be. If you, I mean, think of an old Western or, you know, a mountain man in the 1800s, early 1800s. You're living out there. You don't get to the drugstore or whatever. You, you can't. They might have a bottle of whiskey that they're not just drinking for fun. They're saving that for when they've been seriously injured and they got to do. It's, it's a medication. And I think that's part of what's going on here. Um. <clears throat> I think we can be insulated from, from that reality because we have so much advancement in modern medicine. But if you had no medicine at all, none, you might have a different idea of having a little bit of alcohol around for that purpose. I mean, I grew up taking NyQuil and it made me sleep a lot better. It was like 40 proof. <laughs> I mean, it works. I never did get drunk on it. Never did, never was tempted to drink a bunch of it, but it is highly, it's got a lot of alcohol in it, or at least it used to, but it, it was medicine. I think also she might be being a little ironic in, because if you tie back to verses four and five, kings don't need to be drinking. King, you're king. You don't need to be drinking to forget your pain. Your pain is not that big a deal. The king's pain would not be unlike the meme that you see every once in a while first world problems where you're like bummed out because <sighs> I was going to drive the Mercedes to work today but it's time for the, the, the uh, oil change and so now I have to drive the Cadillac okay that's first world problem you know I got to Starbucks and they were out of the syrup that I wanted and now my day is ruined that's a first world problem. Okay, that's, the king doesn't have problems like the poor person does. So maybe she's being ironic. You don't need that to forget your pain. These people have real pain. She also encourages him to speak out for the powerless, to be a voice for those that don't have a voice with, with 
those that have no means can be the victims of other people and other situations. That's a noble endeavor for a king. Think for a minute of King Ahab. He wanted Naboth's vineyard. Naboth may not have been a member of the poor exactly, but I mean, he did have that land. He did have that little vineyard, but compared to the king, he was poor. He was the victim of a rich man that used his riches and power to take advantage of him. His problem was that was the king. The king was supposed to protect guys like Naboth from people doing that kind of thing to him. That was just one evidence that he was an evil king. He was a predator. He should have been an advocate. See, when the king steps outside the role that he's been given, problems arise. It's the same today. The government, the U.S. government, pretty good at building roads and bridges. They do a good job of that. They're decent at delivering the mail. But when the government steps outside their preordained roles, they often get into trouble. The king does too. There, there, there's, there's an order for things, and God is a God of order. And I think that he, he is building that in, and, that, and that's part of what's going on here. Now, I, I have to tell you, I don't know that what I told you is a satisfactory answer to all that's behind verse 6 and 7. Because it still does say, give drink to the poor. But we have to know, if we interpret scripture with scripture. Earlier in Proverbs, it talked about drunkenness being bad. Earlier in Proverbs, it said wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler, and it's not wise. To... So it can't mean that we're getting them all liquored up because they're poor. That seems like a bad plan. So the next time people come over for the fellowship hall while we're over there doing our thing, and they're like, hey, do you have some... Uh, we're, we have some, need some money for gas. We're like, no, but I'll tell you what, let's go get you, get you some Jack Daniels. We'll make you forget about your problems. No, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. All right, well, anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can enjoy the word. Uh, I don't know why that says that the way it does, Lord, but I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about it because I trust you. I, I think that uh, at least part of the explanation is what we've said tonight, that uh, we have to have concern for the poor and the poor have conditions and circumstances that we don't really understand always, but uh, we need to advocate and be a voice for people that uh, are not in as good a situation. And I just pray that you'd give us real wisdom when it comes to dealing with situations like that and not just sort of an easy fix that makes it easier for us. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in the situations that we've been praying about, both that we mentioned tonight and also others. Uh, you know, a couple of situations that I've been praying about, people that are in real difficulty, and I pray that your grace and mercy on them and uh, for others here that are coming to mind with some of our brothers and sisters here, that both situations they haven't mentioned, but also family members or loved ones or acquaintances that, that need a real touch from you. And I just pray that you would attend to those. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming tonight.